Good afternoon. My name is Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom here, and I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. And we have a very exciting and timely program today because at this very moment, uh, President Trump is sitting down at the White House with President el-Sisi of Egypt. And our topic today is uh, I'm going to ask you all to turn off your cell phones. I forgot to say that. Um, but to, uh, we're going to be talking about U.S.-Egyptian relations in the age of ISIS. And um, Egypt, of course, is a close ally in the Arab world of the United States. It is the most populous Arab country. And it, uh, Sam Tadros uh, has told me that a quarter of the world's Arab speakers are in Egypt or from Egypt. Um, it also has the largest um, non-Muslim population in the Arab world, the largest um, Christian population uh, of the Copts. Um, there are more Copts in Egypt than there are Jews in Israel, so it really is a significant non-Muslim population. It is one of the United States' largest aid recipients and has been for many years. Um, it receives annually about $1.3 billion in assistance. And there's also the Suez Canal and the Camp David Courts that are, have been at, traditionally at the heart of American interests in Egypt. So President Trump has announced this visit as an occasion to reboot our relationship. And we're going to be discussing what that will look like. Um, in 2009, you'll recall that President Obama went to Egypt and delivered uh, a new initiative speech, um, which was a, a significant a turning point, uh, or was, to, was intended to be a turning point, where he said that um, he hoped to have a new beginning for the U.S. relationship with the Muslim world and, and addressed his remarks um, over the head of the heads of the government of President Mubarak at the time to directly to the Muslim people. So this is a very new reboot. And we're going to begin by um, talking about uh, what is going on right now in the Oval Office or in the White House? What is the conversation? So I'd like to start with Sam. Uh, Sam Tadros is a Hudson Center uh, senior fellow. He is the author of the book Motherland Lost, Egypt and Cops, Coptic Quest for Modernity. He um, has mapped Islamism in Egypt and he has written widely for the media, um, including uh, the Wall Street Journal and current trends in Islamic ideology and the Atlantic and many other publications. And he is Egyptian. Um, Ambassador Alberto Fernandez is sitting next to me on my left. And he is vice president of the Middle East Media Research Institute. He was also the coordinator for strategic counterterrorism communications at the State Department for three years in the, um, during the Obama administration. He is a career foreign, he has been a career foreign uh, official for 30 years and servicing mostly in the Middle East, but also in Latin America and other countries. So we're gonna begin by, uh, Sam, I'd like you to tell us what you think. We don't know exactly what is going to be discussed at this meeting today. Um, but what you think is in the Egyptian portfolio? What are their interests? Well, thank you, Nina, for the introduction. I think, in a sense, the Egyptian goal of this visit has already been achieved. Um, the most important thing for President Sisi was receiving this invitation to Washington and being welcomed in the White House. Uh, for the past three years, since he, um, since the military coup that removed the Muslim Brotherhood, and since he came to power, he has felt that the world has not seen him as, in a sense, legitimate. Um, this uh, comments about the military coup versus a popular uprising, uh, comments about the, the repression in the country, and the Obama administration's lack of um, interest in welcoming him to Washington has made him very keen on getting that target, being welcomed in Washington, being seen as an equal partner, as an ally of the United States. 
So that in, of it, in it of itself has been the first goal of the Egyptian side in this visit. However, the Egyptian president also comes with uh, a lot of asks. Um, the Obama administration had put certain restrictions on military aid to Egypt concerning cash flow financing, uh, limits on Egypt's ability that it had for many years, only second to Israel in being able to buy weapons in advance, paying them for, for them later, certain limits on the kinds of weapons that Egypt would uh, be able to uh, buy. The Obama administration created four uh, specific restrictions on the kind of uh, military equipment that would be allowed for the Egyptians or, or would be encouraged for the Egyptians to acquire. So the first thing on his or the first priority for him is to remove those restrictions. The Egyptians would want more weapons, would want weapons not limited to the four categories that the Obama administration has identified. Um, second portfolio or second issue for him is economic aid. Egypt is confronting an economic uh, problems, to say the least. Um, it's been able to secure some funding, significant funding from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, but they'd like more U.S. commitment and assistance uh, to the economic problems of the country. In general, the Egyptian military historically and the presidency have viewed the U.S. aid as A, uh, theirs by right. They have signed the peace treaty with Israel, and that's the price that uh, the United States was committed to, and B, that it has diminished in terms of value over the years. What $1.3 billion could have bought you in 1979 is not what it buys you today. So from the Egyptian perspective, they'd like more money for weapons, more money for economic aid, and more um, symbolic support for Egypt. A um, uh, sense that Egypt is still uh, the leader of the um, Middle East, of the Arab world, that it still matters. Uh, the Egyptian president is likely to come with suggestions um, of a role that he can play in the peace process, uh, that Egypt can be there as a partner, a broker in that process, basically re-putting Egypt as one of the most important allies for the United States in the Middle East. Well, the, uh, this visit comes at an inflection point when ISIS is, uh, seems to be re-establishing itself maybe in the Sinai and has um, produced a number of videos and statements, which is an interest, of course, um, of the uh, Trump administration. President Trump has uh, vowed to eradicate radical Islamic terror from the face of the earth, um, but yet uh, he has also, the administration is opposed to nation building and uh, wants to reduce foreign aid. So, Ambassador, what is going to be the American portfolio? Well, I think um, and Samuel described, I think, very well, just as the uh, CC government came in, um, you know, gaining something from an initial meeting, I think the, the new American administration also uses this first meeting to also put down a marker that it has uh, interests which are overwhelmingly national security related and it's not going to be distracted from a kind of uh, the background story of the previous Obama years and the diffidence that existed in the Obama administration about dealing with Egypt on certain things. Uh, that it's basically putting a marker down that we are going to engage with Egypt, we are going to engage in a full-throated way with the Egyptian government, with the Sisi government, to get progress on the issues that we care about the most. The number one issue for this administration in this regard is obviously is the writ large, the counterterrorism issue is the defeat of ISIS, particularly in the region, the destruction of it uh, in the region. And there, Egypt has a role to play both in terms of Egypt itself, of the kind of the three challenges that, that Egypt faces when it comes to uh, Islamist terrorism, the challenge of, of, of the Islamic State itself inside Egypt, in uh, Wilayat Sina, um, the, 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 the danger, which is growing, of 
the, uh, the, the activism and the uh, poisonous narrative of the Ikhwan morphing into um, um, direct action terrorist groups like Hassan, like uh, Liwa Athaura, um, and then the danger of kind of uh, that can come with this this danger spreading in the Nile Valley, going from Sinai in the Nile Valley, and coming in from neighboring states where there's where there's ungoverned space, places like Libya. So so primarily looking at it through the lens of counterterrorism and looking at it through the lens of the kinetic part of counterterrorism, <clears throat> but then the second part of that, which I think the administration will be looking for is something which they have very openly marked as a priority for the administration, but have yet to flesh it out. And that is the, the ideological challenge of Salafi jihadism in the region. You know, President, President Assisi, very early on, said some very positive things that were noticed in Washington, especially, to be blunt, on the Republican side, uh, of the ledger in Washington about confronting uh, jihadism, about confront, you know, in his speech to Al Azhar, confronting the kind of the ideological dimension of of the challenge. That is something that was received very positively uh, in this town, especially in certain areas. I know we certainly did in uh, at memory. So I think looking at how you both respond in a more effective way kinetically. You know, what can the administration do? What the, can the administration do to get the Egyptians to move towards being uh, even more effective in counterinsurgency, even more effective in special operations uh, in Sinai, and then also creative, smart ways to go beyond, you know, some Azhar guy standing up and saying, you know, the Salafi jihadism is, is bad, kind of going on to find creative, smart, aggressive ways to challenge the appeal of the default ideology in the Middle East today. The default ideology in the Middle East today is some type of Islamism. So Egypt's role in that. The third thing which um, you alluded to and you alluded to it as well, I see is actually less significance, significant, which is the the idea of Egypt as this kind of regional player. Yes, the administration is interested in Arab-Israeli peace. Yes, Egypt can be helpful in Libya and Sudan and here and there and stuff like that. But I don't see that that is the real priority for the administration. It's more about counterterrorism. It's more about combating the threat of radical Islamism in the region and the sense that, yes, Egypt is a partner. Yes, Egypt is a uh, an important partner, maybe the most important partner, but also Egypt is, and I commend those of you who haven't read it to Sam's piece for Hudson on this, Egypt is also the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Egypt is also the playing ground where the struggle is being waged. That, in the end, is what makes Egypt most important. Re aside from its, you know, its big army and its image of itself and the region and all of that, is that all of these fissures, all of these, uh, the, the, the crisis of, uh, crisis of authority in this Sunni Arab Muslim world, the challenge of Islamism, the challenge of governance, all of these are playing out on the great battlefield, which is the Arab Republic of Egypt. Sam, so it sounds like what the ambassador is saying is that Egypt could very well get its money after all, that, um, that uh, if it can deliver on uh, and accept this new role of mm -hmm. counterterrorism, uh, what do you think? Will it be able to can you tell us about what ISIS is doing in the Sinai right now? It's, it's popped up with a video on the, threatening the cops, saying that they're, they're um, a number one target, that they are um, their favorite prey is the term, the phrase they use. And they also call themselves, I think for the first time, the Islamic State of Egypt. Can you tell us more about what, uh, what is happening with ISIS? Sure. Um, the, Islamic, the Islamic State, of course, or let me put it this way, the problem of terrorism in Sinai uh, goes back to about uh, the year 2000 or 99, where the first Salafi jihadi group was formed in the Sinai, the Tawhid and Jihad. They conducted a number of uh, operations targeting tourists. Um, they had the bombings of the hotels in Taba, in Nueva, and other cities. 
And then we had a period, in a sense, of um, quiet in the Sinai as the group was um, uh, targeted by the Egyptian state, forced into going through the tunnels to Gaza, where they mixed with Palestinian Salafis who had been fighting Hamas at the time, Ansar Gundallah and other groups, and created a new group out of that. The Egyptian revolution allowed them a free um, opportunity to operate in the Sinai, the collapse of the security forces there, and they created what they termed the supporters of uh, Jerusalem, Ansar Bayt al Maqdis. Um, two years ago, they gave their allegiance to the Islamic State, which through its establishment of a caliphate became the most appealing um, jihadi, Salafi jihadi group in the, in the world in this sense, attracting supporters both in Egypt, in Libya, in Nigeria, in all other uh, areas of the world where Islamists see it as the most successful Salafi jihadi model to follow. Um, however, the group has also been a Sinai-based group. They have done uh, spectacular attacks in Cairo, uh, the bombing of the uh, Coptic Cathedral compound, other such Summer. attacks. Yeah. Um, but they are also limited by the fact that they heavily draw their membership from the tribal networks of the Sinai. Um, their supporters, their, their uh, protection comes from the reality that there is a breeding ground there, there's a welcoming environment there that um, has been completely alienated by the Egyptian state and that sees these guys as doing a noble fight against the repressive state. Uh, as a result, they've been able to grow their presence in Sinai. Initially, they were based in a small border area, the Rafah Sheikh Zouid area. Now we're seeing them able to operate in Al Harish, the capital of northern Sinai. We're talking about a city of a quarter of a million people, where they are able to um, have nightly patrols, for example, uh, checking driver licenses. Um, walking in the streets with their uh, rocket launchers and clashing coughs, that ability to project their presence and power in El Arish at the center of northern Sinai, that's um, a reflection of their growing uh, This is power. the area from where the Christians were, were, are being killed and were being driven out. Which brings us exactly to the Christians. Um, the Copts in Egypt, in a sense, have been always a favorite of Islamist groups. Uh, perhaps this is a reflection of the extraordinary number of Egyptians that have played an instrumental role in the formation of Islamist ideology, Salafi jihadi ideology. So whether we're talking from Banna, from Sayyid Qutb, from Ayman al-Zawahri, well, my homeland has been important in that regard. So naturally, these Islamists, um, the hatreds towards the Copts, the intolerance that they have against them, has been translated into a significant presence of the Copts in the literature within the Islamist universe, even outside of Egypt. If you remember, for example, the targeting of the uh, church in Baghdad in 2012, in, yes. sorry, 2010, yes. December 2010, asking for the release of an Egyptian woman that they claimed had converted to Islam and was being held by the church. This significance has always been there. Um, we've also had the Copts in Egypt uh, receiving fatwas from uh, various Islamist groups in the 80s and 90s, saying that basically the rules of Zimmitude don't apply to them any longer. So if Zimmis are protected people under the rule of Islam, Copts were no longer Zimmis. They would not receive any form of protection, and thus their blood and targeting them is permissible. These fatwas have been now copied and repeated by the Islamic State that saying basically that all those rules of how these non-Muslims should be treated under the, the rule of the Islamic State do not apply any longer because the Copts, by their very actions, are warriors, are fighting against Islam, and thus it is permissible to target them. We've seen the targeting of um, uh, six or seven cops killed in El Arish, forcing the whole Coptic community of northern Sinai to leave the territory. But we've also seen a number of very um, alarming incidents mm -hmm. of cops being massacred, sometimes in their beds, uh, sometimes simply in the streets, 
in the last two or three months all over the country. Um, the Islamic State hasn't directly claimed these attacks, but it's a very interesting development that it's the same method, it's being repeated throughout the country. How much of this is a reflection of Islamic State supporters in these areas? That's something that we'll continue to see in the future. Um, and Ambassador, you've also written recently about another video that ISIS in Egypt has released last week um, about the um, sorcerers the, and you, uh, the killing, the beheading of several sorcerers in Sinai. Uh, what is all that about? What are they... Uh, well, um, what that video tries to do is part of a larger trend, which actually ISIS does in other places. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that uh, while uh, ISIS propaganda is tailored to the reality of an audience that it's focused on, um, it, 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 it has certain patterns everywhere you know, that are, that are found everywhere. It seeks to present an alternate rule of governance, an alternate reality uh, of a specific place. So the last video from a week ago, which, uh, which is called The Light of Sharia, Nur of Sharia, uh, an ISIS Sinai video, by the way, it has elements which lead you to believe that, and, and this is, I think, um, you know, when, when you look at propaganda, you always have to remember that they're presenting a reality they want you to believe, right? So they present a skewed reality that shows ISIS Sinai to be much more ubiquitous, much more powerful, much more controlling than it actually is. The video has elements which seem to indicate that it was probably, even though it's put out under the ISIS Sinai brand, it was actually, uh, there was a lot of, of, of editing and work done outside of Egypt, uh, you know, whether in Raqqa or Mosul or, or you know, al Khair or wherever it is, somewhere else there was a lot of, of prepping of, of that video. But what it seeks to present is an ideal form of jihadist governance. It's important to point out because all too often the debate in Washington is, oh, you know, CC is bad or CC is good or Morsi was better or whatever. And that the, the ISIS video, this ISIS video and others before it basically says that all of the Egyptian ruling class, past and present, all of them are infidel, all of them are to be rejected, <laughs> Ikhwan, anti-Ikhwan, Christian, Islamist, it doesn't matter. They're all bad. They're all servants of infidelity, uh, servants of, of polytheism, and they all have to be uh, eliminated. And then in this video, which ends as they usually do with the money shot of two poor old men being beheaded as sorcerers, I mean, the whole video is basically showing this is a righteous Islamic government, this is what it looks like. So it shows, uh, you know, uh, 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 tobacco plants being torn up, drugs being burned, uh, Sufis being kidnapped, forcibly uh, brainwashed or forced to repent and having to sign repentance Sunni documents. Muslims. Exactly. So it's basically about presenting a kind of uh, idealized, stylized, uh, uh, form of what a righteous, you know, uh, governance under the flag of Tawheed would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously knowing and thinking that this message will resonate with part of the Egyptian population beyond its little enclave in Sinai. Yeah, I want to get to that with you, Sam, because you have mapped the Islamist groups in Egypt, and I want to hear about what your view is whether that kind of messaging is going to be as popular as it was in uh, Iraq and Syria, um, where ISIS also presented itself as a purifier, uh, driving out, killing, enslaving, uh, using these shocking, um, brutally methods, brutal methods that grab the world's attention, filming it in very professional, slick means. And also um, resurrecting these these long um, dead rejected practices of slavery, um, of chattel slavery, of sexual slavery of women, uh, of from the Yazidi and the Christian groups, and and basically uh, in addition you know, declared genocide by our government. Um, it is also a type of ethnic cleansing or religious cleansing, a purification, and um, so will that. 
Is that what we're going to be? We're already seeing it in North Sinai. Are we going to be? Uh, is this going to resonate among? And who would it resonate among? In, in, in which groups in Egypt? Well, uh, I'd say in general, Islamism is a um, is in a state of perpetual flux. Um, by its very nature, Islamism uh, seeks to create a state that connects heaven and earth. Um, a model of Islamic governance, um, a return to uh, previous centuries of Islamic practices, to a point in time when Islam was uh, great, both in military, material, and uh, cultural terms. Um, and that project, in a sense, until today, no one has been successful in finding uh, an actual methodology for achieving it. So uh, at a certain point in time comes the Muslim Brotherhood and says the methodology to achieve that uh, dream is to uh, the six stages that Hassan al-Banna articulated. We're going to uh, work on the Muslim individual, the Muslim uh, family, the society, until we reach the end state. Then will come the, the uh, quietest Salafis, as they refer to in Washington, and say, no, religion has been corrupted. We need to purify it. Uh, we need to bring in new generations of Muslims on this purified form of religion. Comes um, jihadi groups and tell you that uh, we need to fight the governments that don't apply Sharia, that don't um, apply the truth by, by other than what God has actually revealed in his Quran. Um, that continuation, that continuous state of flux is basically a result of the failure of previous ideologies and each one claiming to be the one. We're going to be the guys that achieve that dream. In a sense, the failure of all previous ideologies has been the, the reason for the appeal of the Islamic State. Um, if you're an Egyptian Islamist and you buy into the basic framework of the idea, and you look at the Muslim Brotherhood methodology today, where is the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, it's in jail. It's uh, underground. It's uh, escaping to Turkey and Qatar. It's not an appeal. It's not a successful model. If the Brotherhood model was so successful, why did, it why did it collapse so easily in one year after coming to power? And uh, that's let alone talk about the failures of that model and actually achieving any of the Islamist um, demand list during its year in power. You look at the scene, you look at Ayman al-Zawahri, and where is this guy today? I mean, hiding in a, in a cave in Afghanistan or a villa in Pakistan, whichever of them. The end result is that after 40 years of fighting for his dream, he's nowhere closer to it. But, but Egypt isn't really secular, the, the culture either. And in fact, the, a recent Pew uh, poll showed that over 70% of the population want rule by Sharia. I think it depends, uh, I mean, you ask these questions and it depends on uh, how do you define Sharia. There's no doubt that the Islamist message um, is appealing in Egypt, continues to be appealing until today, um, due to the fact that it has not been discredited as an ideology. A certain methodology of Islamism has been discredited, mm -hmm. that of the Muslim Brotherhood, but the ideology itself has not. Secondly, because there are no other competing ideologies. The basic premises of Islamism make sense for an average Egyptian. It doesn't make him a radical or an extremist or an Islamist per se, but these basic premises okay, are accepted. But um, President al-Sisi and al-Azhar um, have been talking about, a, well, President al-Sisi talked about a revolution in religion, and, and then he went on to explain what he meant by that, of being a revolution in ideology, really, not the religion itself. And um, so is that being received well? Is that is the government going forward with this? Uh, they've reformed some textbooks. I think that Allah's, and he made this, this appeal at Al-Azhar, which is the uh, 10th century uh, center of Sunni learning. Um, so he made it to, and, he, and he, taught, he, he challenged the clerics and religious scholars in his speech. Um, Al-Azhar has since then, more recently, also started talking about reform. What can you tell us about that? 
ambassador jump in too? Uh, well, I mean, um, the 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 speech that CC gave was uh, very well received, but the follow on has been. You know, as that Arab proverb says, you know, she was pregnant with a mountain and gave birth to a mouse. Uh, it it's, sounds better in Arabic. Uh, you know, the, the, this a very sweeping, powerful speech. There, have, there has been some movement from Al-Azhar. There have been some efforts. But there is a tremendous amount of space for... Islamist extremism in Egypt still in the media, um, in, in, in both print media and in broadcast media, you still have secularists uh, and liberals persecuted. Not leaving the government aside, right? By the religious establishment, you have the cases of people like Islam Bukhari and people like that. So, so the government talked about reform, and the reform has been talked about but hasn't been really Im been implemented. There's been a nibbling around the edges, but there you cannot say that the Egyptian government has done something which would be truly revolutionary that has never happened in the Arab world, which is to have a government on the level of ideology, on the level of, of textbooks, on the level of the religious establishment, really embrace a kind of a liberal uh, reinterpretation of problematic texts and mm -hmm. and concepts that are used by Salafi jihadists and by Islamists to to right. What does jihad mean? Who the is nature of that? jihad? The nature of kufr? The nature yeah. of shirk? The question of governance? Of al wala wal bara? You know who rules? Who are you loyal to? Who do you reject? All of those things. There's a lot that can be done. It seems to me the President Sisi kind of put out a very enticing marker, but there's a lot of work that has to happen which hasn't even begun yet. Yeah, there, there is, I guess, a, a case in point is that the Roman Catholic Pope, Francis, is going to visit this the end of this month to Al-Azhar, picking up a ruptured relationship, ruptured by Pope Benedict XVI, who... Um, denounced the uh, bombing of a church at Christmas time in Egypt, a uh, Coptic church, and then asked for protections for the Christians. And um, Al Azhar said that was unacceptable, um, and that that this was a you know a defamation of Islam. And after the uh, Pope Francis's outreach and saying you know we want to repair this, and uh, in the fall. Uh, I, th I think I, there was reports of a visit by the papal nuncio to, uh, uh, or, or by the, the sheikh um, Graham Imam to uh, the papal nuncio, saying, uh, "You know, we can do the visit, but no criticism of Islam." So it's going to be kind of a tricky conversation, I think, when the Pope goes. I will say, uh, Sam probably wants to respond to this, but one thing about Egypt which always struck me the first time I went there, which was 1984 as a young diplomat, is that every church in Egypt, and there are a lot of churches in Egypt, had a policeman guarding mm -hmm. it. And why was that? Because also Christian cemeteries had a policeman guarding it. Because already, this is 1984, in the 70s, of course, Everything that you see today that was much of everything that was has been put into place uh, uh, with, against religious minorities in, in Iraq and in Syria had its provat, had its beginning in the 1970s by the Salafi jihadist groups, Egyptian Salafi jihadist groups, the targeting of Christians, the robbing them, uh, saying that this was ghanima or jizya or whatever, the whole question of them not really being the Mies or being the Mies and saying mm -hmm. that they don't have a contract. Egypt was the proving ground for all of this stuff that we saw later on with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic mm -hmm. State. Sam, do you want to? Uh, what are some of the other benchmarks, uh, both for Christians and and also um, you have written about anti-Semitism? I don't know. Yeah, That'd be I another mean, benchmark, I suppose. On on the the issue of uh, President Sisi's uh, call for religious reform or religious revolution, I think it was genuine. Um, it was unprepared. He left his prepared uh, remarks in the classical Arabic and just started speaking in colloquial Egyptian dialect. Um, it reflected his own view, but there never was a plan. 
he has no idea how this uh, reform is going to happen. Uh, he simply left the task to Al-Azhar. And once you began to see these voices outside of the official religious establishment, people like Islam al-Bahiri that the ambassador um, mentioned, um, uh, a TV presenter who began attacking the text on which all the jihadi Salafi interpretations are based. Uh, once you began to have that, the religious establishment auto automatically called for stopping of this. The program was cancelled, and Islam al Bahiri was thrown in jail for a year. So the the limits for blasphemy for blasphemy basically. Yeah, the blasphemy laws have been uh, the the and this use of course of blasphemy laws to uh, stop any serious discussion. Uh, both as a method to target the religious minorities, uh, Christians, Shiites, Baha'is have been targeted by these blasphemy laws, but also Muslims, to stop any serious conversation, examination, yes. or calls for um, different interpretations. We've seen that in the past from Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid and, and the divorce case of, against him that uh, since he is an apostate, then his Muslim wife has to leave him. We've seen the use of these right. blasphemy laws. Um, so there are limits to President Sisi's call. There's a, a genuine spirit there. Yes, he's a, he would like to see a reform of the religious discourse, but he has no plan. Plus, he has to deal with the reality of Al-Azhar. He's recently also clashed with Al-Azhar over the question of divorce, for example. He commented on the high number of divorces in the country, asking if there can be a limit on the right of divorce. And the uh, answer from Al-Azhar was a very clear public uh, humiliation of the president of no, and this is not debatable, this is the, the religion as it is, Basically, don't talk about these issues or you will be humiliated in public. So, so I think there are, um, while Washington has welcomed this talk a lot, there are actually a lot of limits to what Sisi can offer in this regard. The Egyptian educational system remains a disaster. Um, it simply teaches nothing about the outside world. And in that vacuum, the Islamists fill it. My favorite story is about an Egyptian journalist, a Christian, who was getting engaged and being asked by a colleague of hers uh, where her husband would spend the first night. Um, I mean, she didn't get the question, what do you mean? We're not sure where we'll spend the honeymoon. No, I mean, where will he be when the priest is with you? Turns out that her colleague and many Egyptian Muslims believe that uh, Christian girls, the night of first night, goes to the priest. Where did they get that idea from, you might wonder? Well, it's a movie, Braveheart. In the absence of any actual information about people that they have shared uh, 14 centuries of living together, I mean, in a sense, every Egyptian Muslim, his great-grandparents were originally Copts from Egypt. And that lack of knowledge about people that you live in the same country with, allowing all these superstitions, these conspiracy theories, these propaganda by Islamists to fill that vacuum. This lack of knowledge about world religions, uh, I mean, Nina, you've done work on the um, Saudi textbooks and, and the kind of intolerance that they teach. A similar story is in Egypt, whether it's in Al-Azhar textbooks or even in the Egyptian government textbooks. In The other simply doesn't exist. One, one of the great ironies is, you know, you have the Egyptian government and its supporters and you have the uh, opposition, especially the Islamist opposition and its supporters. And of course, they disagree on many things, but you can find virulently, virulent anti-Semitism in the pro-government camp and you can find yeah. virulent anti-Semitism in the anti-government camp and each one blaming the others of being in the pocket of the Jews or the pocket of the Israelis or the pocket of the Jews and the Israelis. That's, that's one area where actually they both share the same, some of the same elements of the worldview. And it's, it's, as Sam said, it's because they're drawing from a kind of a heritage of anti-Semitism, just like there is a heritage of an ingrained, deeply ingrained anti-Christian sentiment that has always been there for many years. It doesn't mean that all Muslims in Egypt are, are, are virulently anti-Christian, but that element has always existed to a certain extent.
Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, if you read the Brotherhood sources, Sisi is Jewish. His mother is a Moroccan Jew. If you read the government sources, <laughs> Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Brotherhood, is a Jew, of course. So both agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, and then the protocols of the elders of Zion that fabricated uh, anti-Semitic track uh, from Bolshevik Russia was um, put on TV during Ramadan through a government-sanctioned uh, uh, outlet. In back in yeah, 2002, yeah, yeah. When... And I'm sure the, the the track itself can be found in Arabic. Definitely, easily. definitely. I mean, it's one of the most popular books mm -hmm. if you're walking in the streets of Cairo. Uh, one time, um, a few years ago, I th last time I was there for the U.S. government, uh, which was uh, three years ago, I was staying at the Semiramis Intercontinental Hotel, and there was, in the little bookstore there, you go in, and there was an entire shelf of anti-Semitic material in Arabic. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was just one. There was a whole range of, you know, vampires with the Star of David on them and this kind of, of material in a five-star hotel frequented by by foreigners. And of course, this was in Arabic. I think probably maybe Saudi guests get it a lot. But it's important, while this is true, it's important also, I want. I don't want to always focus on this, but, but Sam wrote a tremendous piece on the Jewish experience in Egypt, which I, if you haven't read it, uh, really captures the nuance of of this phenomenon. And it's there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of awful things, but there's a lot of complexity as well, and I highly recommend his piece on this uh, issue. I forget the name of it, but it's a tremendous piece that he wrote. Yeah. Okay, I think we should now turn to public questions, and we have quite a few. Okay, should we start in the uh, back, move forward? And please identify your, yourself and your organization. Hi, uh, I'm Christine Ariaga. I'm one of hi, fellow Cuban. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am one of nine commissioners at the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. And um, thank you, Sam, briefed us before we went to Egypt earlier this year. And um, we heard a lot of what you said, but we also met with a lot of NGOs and evangelical groups, and we met with uh, the Pope, and we met with the Grand Sheik of al Azhar, and we also got a lot of stories about um, or a lot of factual evidence, they argue, that we should be supporting al-Sisi's government for his great improvements in the religious freedom area. So one, some of the things they quoted, for instance, was that the Sheik had participated in a number of interfaith dialogue and conferences, and they're holding one at the in this fall. Uh, the Pope said that al-Sisi had attended three um, Christmas, um, was it two or three? I thought it was two. Two, two, two um, Christmas celebrations there, which was unprecedented, and that signaled that the cops would be protected. Of course, afterwards there was there was a bombing. Um, there was a lot of the evangelical ministers we met with said things were vastly better under Al Sisi, um, and that a lot of his policies had to do with dealing with huge cultural and complex issues. If you had to rank them in turn of in terms of advances or not advances of religious freedom, what would you say? Um, I have no doubt that President Sisi is um, not a fanatic. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that um, any, any suggestion that he hates Christians or, or in anything in that regard. Um, I think he also appreciates uh, the fact that the Christians didn't complain after the um, massive burning and attacks on Coptic churches in August of 2013, which was the largest attack on the Coptic churches since the 14th century. Um, he really appreciates the fact that Copts, in a sense, proved that they are loyal Egyptian citizens. He has an excellent working relationship with the Pope. However, this has not translated into anything um, meaningful for the people on the ground. Um, building a church in Egypt remains a significant problem. Um, we passed, Egypt passed um, just um, in the end of 2016, a new law on the building of churches. It 
makes matters, I don't want to say worse, but it doesn't change any of the facts on the ground of how impossible it is for you to build a church in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian police does not protect Copts from any of the attacks that they suffer from. In every single incident of attacks on Copts, and we've had about a 100 um, such attacks under the CC government, um, the regime resorts to reconciliation sessions where the two parties, elders of two parties, are brought together to kiss each other, uh, usually giving in to the mob's demands. So if the mob is demanding that uh, Christians are prohibited from building a church in a particular village, then the reconciliation session decides that, yes, they won't get a church. Um, and no one is punished, which creates a culture of not only impunity, but encouragement. Hey, let's go attack the Christians. Um, we're going to get what we want because the government is going to force them to accept that in the reconciliation session, and no one will ever go to jail for doing that. Um, that's a serious problem. Uh, Copts in Egypt are, in a sense, not asking for a special status, but for the equal application of the law to protect people from having their homes burned into these regular pogroms that take place, uh, usually without anyone being killed, although there have been incidents of people being killed in them. But these have become really a regular occurrence in the country. Um, the the religious leaders in the Middle East are in a position that I don't envy them. Um, they are cornered from all sides, and they uh, do what they can to protect their communities. So um, the position that they take, the the defense of the governments that they offered, are is understandable given the circumstances that they are. Um, confronting. I, I mean, I, I'm happy I'm not in their shoes to, uh, to be forced to deal with these um, horrible circumstances between uh, uh, the conditions that you're living in and the fear of things going much worse if the CC regime would fall tomorrow. Just on that, I would add that there's been, and you mentioned it, uh, there's been a lot of positive symbolism yeah. Uh, and they focus a lot on that. And I'm sure with the Pope Francis visit, you're going to see a whole bunch of positive symbolism. The problem is the difference, as Sam said, between the symbolism and the reality, the kind of everyday reality on the ground for people, and especially, let's face it, village people, poor people, people who can be easily uh, 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 attacked and, and, uh, and humiliated. And on the other side, you do have to say that even with the symbolism as weak as it is for us, you know, uh, President Sisi's attack, there's an ISIS video from 2014 where he's called, Ya Sisi, Ya Abdus Salib, Sisi, oh you slave of the cross, as an Egyptian uh, ISIS fighter tears up his Egyptian passport. So even the weak T that we see with that symbolism actually provokes a reaction, not just from ISIS, but from other Islamists as well. All the mythology that Sam referred to about kind of Christians, kind of similar to what anti-Semites would talk about Jews, you know, they have too much power and they have money and they, they're doing all these things, uh, exists in the kind of the wider atmosphere there. And it's something that the government has to deal with. Even if the government wants to do more, it exists in an environment where that bigotry is deeply embedded in a broader society, a society that they need to appeal to, to a certain extent, to survive. Okay, yeah, Hillel in the back. Of, of the Hudson Institute. Thanks very much for the discussion. Um, the title of this event and some of the discussion early on suggested that one big common ground between uh, that will be discussed is uh, common enemies, uh, in particular ISIS. Um, and and uh, so two questions. One is um, the focus is on ISIS, but of course we have declared that we have two major enemies, region Iran as well as ISIS. So I was wondering what uh, you what uh, you thought, especially Ambassador Fernandez thought, might be the character of the discussion about that between this administration and President Sisi, but also what. What we might be asking Egypt to do on the counterterrorism front and what they reasonably, in your judgment and experience, could be doing that they're not doing it already. 
Well, on the on the Iran part, um, definitely this is a theme that the um, uh, leadership, the Sunni Arab Muslim leadership in the region, not just in Egypt, is looking for the administration to follow through and looking for it to differentiate itself from what it saw as the kind of uh, uh, weak or dishonest or intentionally uh, betraying attitude of, of the previous administration. That's why, you know, one of the mythologies in Washington is, oh, you know, President Trump, all the Arabs are all upset about him. Actually, that's not exactly true because they see him, unlike people in Washington, see him within the context of what they saw as an Obama policy which favored the enemies of the Sunni Arab Muslim governments, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the Gulf states, etc. So, so there is a kind of sense that this administration should somehow have the Sunni Arab government's back when it comes to this issue. Now, how that's going to actually turn out after the priority issue, which is the defeat of the Islamic State, turns out that's, that's a, a, a big question. Uh, on the whole question of counterterrorism, I think my sense is that um, the administration is first going to look home, that Egypt basically has to have a better handle on its own uh, you know, jihadist uh, threats that it has a, at home. It's addressing them, but, but what are creative ways that can be done better, whether in Sinai or the Nile Valley or around the frontier? And the one thing I'd, I'd add is that the, the administration, I think, is if it will approach Egypt as the major Sunni country, is going to discover soon, just as the Saudis have discovered, that Egypt doesn't see itself as a Sunni country in the first place. Jesus was in Egypt. Um, precisely <laughs> because perhaps the Shiite community is so minute in size. This whole Sunni-Shiite divide does not resonate in Egypt the same way that it does in the Gulf or in the Levant. And as a result, Egypt has uh, given verbal support to Saudi Arabia. Um, President Sisi famously says that it's a matter of just uh, the time it would take us to reach them. Um, if anything happens, we'll be there. What's things happened in Yemen, Egypt said, well, we have a long history in Yemen, we're not really interested in getting involved there. Egypt simply doesn't see Iran as an enemy or as a threat the same way that the other Arabs to its east see it. And that impacts the way that it, uh, it will approach the issue. Although the irony there is, a memory we wrote a report on Fitna Television, is that Egypt actually produces its fair share of anti-Shia propaganda. Uh, maybe to appeal to a Gulf Arab audience, but there's actually a lot of it is in the Gulf, a lot of it is in Egypt, a lot of it is in North Africa. And in both Egypt and North Africa, these are populations where actually there are no Shia or very and, few. And funded by the Gulf yes. channels and the Gulf institutions. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, over here in the middle then. Hi, Rachel Oswald, I'm a reporter with Congressional Quarterly. Uh, taking a broader look at this topic, um, uh, I believe the misery index for Egypt stands somewhere around 45%. Um, as you know, half of Egypt is under the age of 30, um, high um, levels of youth unemployment. Um, and I'm wondering what all of this means for um, uh, President Trump's um, moves toward embracing Sisi in the event that there is further domestic instability in Egypt, um, given all those um, population factors, what kind of a position will the United States be in if the Egyptian people, rightly or wrongly, perceive the United States as condoning human rights abuses? Guess what? The U.S. is, uh, is committed no matter what it does. Um, there's no way you can walk away from this. The, the finessing that occurs in Washington about this maybe is, is noted by the Egyptian elite, you know, kind of Obama versus. But if you look at extremists and you look at the man in the street, it actually doesn't really matter that much. Uh, so this is basically a problem or an issue you have to deal with. So you better, you better engage, try to get the change that you can. On economic issues, and just if I could just make a point on the, the misery index, there are two things. One, Egypt is very slowly improving on the macro level uh, when it comes to economic issues. It's still terrible 
Uh, you know, it's number 122 in the World Bank Index of ease of doing business, which is really bad. Uh, if they could get to the level of Morocco, which is, say, 68, that would be an improvement. One of the challenges for the administration is not so much not to embrace them, uh, as you said. One of the challenges for the administration is to, I think, is to move to do these big macroeconomic issues, you know, the stuff the World Bank has you to do and stuff like that, but to also find creative ways to help the underclass that makes sense. In other words, you're doing these macro stuff that the economists ask you to do, which often make life more miserable for the poor. You need to factor in the human dimension. As you know, the dimension that has occurred in, in Egypt and in other places and things like the rice, the price of bread or the price of certain basic commodities and kind of making, finding ways to kind of on the micro level, try to make life a little more better, a little more dignified, and a little juster for your everyday citizen. Realizing that this administration is not going to be in nation building, it's not going to be able to, 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 you know, kind of turn night into day. Uh, I think there are stuff, there is stuff that could be done on the development side. Uh, within the context of the administration radically remaking, for example, the work of U.S. development, getting away from some of the ridiculous things we've spent money on in Egypt. There, there, there are ways that you could kind of uh, look at kind of addressing the poor in a better way. I think there was a poll done under the, um, back in 2014 or so, uh, where positive perception of the United States stood at uh, the huge number of 1%. Uh, the Obama administration has managed to lose everyone in the country. Uh, the Islamists believed that it had condoned or supported the coup in some fashion. Uh, the regime supporters believed that it had supported the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Christians believed that it had created the Islamic State. Uh, you got a question about that, Ambassador, in <laughs> yeah. a recent yeah. appearance on an Egyptian TV. Everyone in the country at this moment has a negative view of the United States. So I don't know how worse you can do, no matter what policy you actually take. Um, the Sisi regime um, has very different understandings of human rights than the United States, if it has any in the first place. Um, there are huge human rights abuses in the country, um, but it is also uh, a very popular regime. I have no doubt that in a f even in a free and fair elections, President Sisi would win the elections. Um, he, is re he represents a certain reality in the country, a certain um, rejection of the Muslim Brotherhood, a demand for a return to normalcy, to stability, uh, Egyptians, the revolution has led to uh, a complete upheaval in the lives of Egyptians. And many people in Egypt will tell you, sure, things are not great, but better than being Iraq or Syria. And that's becoming the benchmark in the region. Um, you have a dictator, you have a human rights abuser, but look around you. And... I don't agree to that narrative, but it's a narrative that's uh, very popular in the country and that continues to have to give President Sisi a base of support, as well as the reality that there are no alternatives in Egypt. Uh, if you ask any Egyptian, he'll be hard-pressed to name you five individuals that could possibly be a serious candidate for president or for prime minister or for any position for that matter. So as... Um, the Sisi regime is creating problems in the country, definitely, but I don't see any um, alternative on the horizon at the moment to that regime. Well, thank you very much. We're out of time already, so that closes our program. I want to thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our discussants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.